Hey guys, welcome back to today's video. Today is Thursday, January 13th, 2022, and with today's heartbreaking news for the Democratic Party, something that they have been really hoping would not happen, Senator Kirsten Sinema of the state of Arizona announces and reiterates her support to keep the filibuster in place, that she will not be supporting a change to the filibuster in any type of way for voting rights, for uh, any other type of bill through the rest of this Congress and potentially in the future. Now, with this blow to the Democratic Party, it puts them in an unfortunate position for uh, many bills that they aim to pass through the first two years of the Biden administration. The filibuster is a tool that the minority party uses in order to prolong debate enough so that there cannot be a closed debate, meaning that it will not end and the bill ultimately dies because the opposition party does not want to pass it. And Kirsten Cinema cites that this is a powerful tool to, for the minority party to prevent the members of the majority from passing very long uh, and big bills that deal with uh, significant changes. And, you know, while she does say she supports the uh, Voting Rights Act and or the John Lewis Voting Rights Act and other parts of the Democratic agenda that Joe Biden was elected to carry out, she just simply does not support the changing of the filibuster. And she seems to be very similar in this stance to Joe Manchin from the state of West Virginia. Now, before we get into the uh, how did the Democrats get rid of the majority, so I get rid of the filibuster in 2022. Um, we need to see why exactly Kirsten Cinema and Joe Manchin are against it in the first place, because it might provide you a bit of context for some of the senators that are running uh, or uh, Senate candidates that are running in 2022 that would be able to change their, uh, not necessarily change their position, but uh, re might represent a state that is either a bit more conservative or a bit more democratic than some of the states that uh, Cinema and Manchin represent. And looking at the 2018 results, remind yourself of what type of election that this was. The popular vote in the House election went to the Democrats by eight points, the Senate election by 20 points, but that's because there were a bunch of Republican states without uh, elections there. Uh, but the main point is that in 2018, the Democratic Party was soaring high. So remind yourself of that. Now, with that high uh, amount, the state of West Virginia and the state of Arizona voted for their Democratic nominees by a very similar amount. In the state of West Virginia, Joe Manchin defeated his opponent by 3.3%, and Arizona vote, voted for Kirsten Cinema by a margin of 2.4%. Now, the thing about Arizona and the state of West Virginia is that Arizona was previously a red state. The last time it had voted blue was in 1996, at least until the 2020 election. And there hadn't been a Democratic senator for a pretty significant period of time. So Arizona was a state where Kirsten Cinema was an outcast when it came down to electoral politics. So in her eyes, she was elected in a red state but not so much anymore. For the state of West Virginia, Joe Manchin is a bit different. He was a popular governor, ran for an election in 2010, ran for re-election in 2016, sorry, 2012, and then ran for re-election again in 2018. Now, the 2018 election was much narrower than where it was in 2012, and Joe Manchin might be getting scared. West Virginia actually voted for President Trump by over 30 percentage points in both 2016 and 2020. A Democrat hasn't won West Virginia since, get this, 1996. So seeing the similarities between Arizona and West Virginia, one might say, okay, Kirsten Sinema and Joe Manchin are both equally uh, justifiable for their decision on the filibuster. And I'm not one to critique a senator in terms of how they vote, but what I am going to say is that it makes a lot more sense for Joe Manchin to be against changing the filibuster than it does for Kirsten Cinema, because West Virginia was 40 points in favor of Trump and Arizona was just 3.5 in 2016, and he actually lost the state in 2020. So let's talk about what the 2022 election could bring. And the thing about the 2022 map is that we don't actually work with too many competitive races. And keep in mind, there are only two senators right now that seem to be completely vehemently against changing the filibuster in any regard, even to a talking filibuster. And those are West Virginia Senators, uh, West Virginia Senator Joe Manchin, as I've been previously saying, and Arizona Senator Kirsten Sinema. So that brings the Democratic Party down to uh, an eventual 48 seat advantage over the GOP. They might have the majority, but they really only have 48 concrete votes in most of their elections, which means that Democrats, if they are to retain control of the United States Senate, would need to not only win every single seat they have right now, but win two Republican seats 
at least. And we'll talk about what the avenue is to get there. One thing that also is a very big caveat for this uh, situation is that the Democratic Party must win control of the House of Representatives in 2022. And considering they have a four seat majority right now, as someone who's seeing it from the outside, I'm not hopeful for them. I think that this is a election where the GOP is going to have a very strong advantage over the Democratic Party because of the national pushback against the president uh, and what he's been doing, or maybe the lack of action, the inaction that he's been seeing uh, through his Congress, even though Democrats control it. They seem to not be getting anything done from the eyes of the average American. You saw the stimulus checks roll out early on. You saw uh, vaccines rolled out. But beyond that, what else do you know about the Senate? You honestly don't know much because not much has passed in terms of uh, the uh, weight and the significance of what we saw in early 2021 era. But seeing the 2022 Senate map, you know, remind yourself that this election also is going to be very difficult to even see Democrats gaining seats in the United States Senate. Uh, again, I think that it's important to realize the House is already a done deal. There simply isn't going to be a Republican uh, loss in the House of Representatives unless something significantly changes between now and November of this year. And that probably isn't going to happen. Historically speaking, the opposition party almost always wins control of the House of Representatives, and they very well could, as they did after Obama's first uh, two years. In fact, that was a much more impressive victory for the GOP because they gained 63 seats from the Democratic Party, completely demolishing their 250 plus seat majority over the Republican Party, the largest majority that the Democratic Party had experienced in a very long time. And Republicans got rid of it in just two years, and it took Democrats eight years to get it back. Now, I'm characterizing all of the states that we are deeming immediately competitive on our Senate map. These are states where we really are going to see the uh, Republican Party do well. And the only state that actually doesn't fit that characterization is the state of Ohio, where we aren't going to be discussing much just because at this point in time, we very much expect the GOP to win in the state of Ohio. And Tim Ryan there has been drawn out of his congressional district. And there's a lot to be discussed. But, uh, you know, looking at the way that we see the state of Ohio, you have Tim Ryan as the representative. We'll talk a bit about his filibuster uh, stance and get into that in a moment. But really, uh, I, I guess for right now, we can leave it as a toss up. But truly, it should be characterized as a Republican seat as maybe two of these other seats. But historically speaking, they have narrowed down very rapidly and gone in opposite directions than expected. But states such as Ohio, we could have predicted we're going to go for Trump in 2020, going to go for Brown in 2018, going to go for Trump in 2016. But again, that's all for uh, a discussion for another type of video. Now, for the Democratic seats, what we are going to assume for right now in how we get the Democrats to uh, defeat the uh, Republican Party in terms of the filibuster there is by characterizing all of the seats the Democrats currently have as solid Dem. Now, obviously, that isn't a fair characterization, and Republicans have a very real opportunity of picking up Nevada or picking up Arizona or f picking up Georgia or New Hampshire. But for the sake of this video, we aren't going to be talking about the Republican Party's ability to pick up these seats. Now, if you watched my video from maybe, I think, July of 2021, I talked about how the Democratic Party could get to a filibuster, uh, I, I guess not necessarily proof majority, but to a position where they could get rid of the filibuster, and then, of course, it wouldn't really matter. Um, and that was under the assumption that all of these frontrunners would be against the uh, uh, against the filibuster. And we actually haven't had that confirmation into more recently. You know, seeing the uh, Voting Rights Act fail and seeing the Democratic Party having such, such unfortunate luck when it comes down to passing things in the United States Senate, that honestly, it seems to have radicalized many Democrats, including President Joe Biden, who has recently announced his support for changing the filibuster in terms of voting rights. And that is the first time Joe Biden has ever expressed any type of support for changing the filibuster. And that is very, uh, definitely a big deal. Taking a look at what Joe Biden had said in the uh, 2020 Democratic primary when he was uh, being uh, surveyed and interviewed by the New York Times editorial board before they made their endorsement. Now, his comments in response to the editorial board. Now, this is January of 2020. So two years later, you're going to see a complete overturn of this position. They ask, speaking of those other candidates, several of them and referring to other candidates, other 2020 Democratic primary candidates, several of them have proposed major structural reforms to our government and to our democracy. These include abolishing the Electoral College, expanding the size of the Supreme Court, setting term limits as for justices, abolishing the legislative filibuster. Which, if any of these, do you support? And there's a long list there, but one of them is abolishing the legislative filibuster. And Joe Biden says none. And they say, why not? 
And he says, because that structural change requires constitutional amendments, it raises problems that are more damaging than the problem exists. We're in a situation where the reason they gave judges lifetime tenure, you know why. And talking about the legislative filibuster in place, he says, even if Democrats control the Senate, uh, the interviewer says, even if Democrats control the Senate, are you going to move any of your agenda? And Joe Biden responds, yes. But it seems as if he no longer believes in that exact statement. Now backing a change in the filibuster to protect voting rights. I think that after Biden was elected and he saw that the Republican Party was going to go on the opposition towards him in terms of uh, voting uh, efficiency and voting access, he now seems to have been, in an essence, radicalized on the position of the filibuster. Someone who was vehemently against it is now in favor of saying that he will support changing the filibuster. He was one of the six Democrats who said absolutely not on changing the filibuster. Michael Bennett, a senator, John Delaney, a representative, uh, Michael, uh, sorry, Bill de Blasio of the state of New York, in New York City's mayor, a mayor at one point. I believe that is Tim Ryan, a representative, and Joe Sestak, also a representative. All of these people said absolutely not about eliminating the Senate filibuster, including President Biden. But now he has backtracked on that. And seeing this map here, what you are going to find is that every single one of these candidates, the front runners, if we are to put it that way, support changing the legislative filibuster. Every Democrat that's already been characterized in solid D um, seems to have been at least open to the idea, not shutting it down as instantly as cinema and mansion. And these five Democratic frontrunners in the Senate seats, uh, not the incumbents, of course, but the ones that are running against the incumbents or in open races, say that they support abolishing the filibuster. Tim Ryan has said it. I don't have the article up there, but you can find that he has actively called on changing the Senate filibuster. And then taking a look at the rest of the candidates there, I can show you that as well. Sherry Beasley, who actually just recently became the front runner with Jeff Jackson's uh, exit from the race in the state of North Carolina, says that she supports filibuster reform, specifically focused on protecting voting rights. What you find is that John Fetterman, the more progressive Democratic front runner in the state of Pennsylvania, supports eliminating the filibuster. Now, now, he was actually a bit different than Connor Lamb, who in the past seemed to have been apprehensive and is a more of a centrist slash moderate Democrat, who is now announcing, actually announced in January of this year, so just uh, a week ago, actually on the 3rd, 10 days ago, saying that he will vote to end the legislative filibuster, saying that Republicans are abusing it to block voting rights and endanger our democracy. So there you have it, the two Pennsylvania frontrunners, all for it, the North Carolina frontrunner, all for it. What you have uh, in terms of the uh, Wisconsin Senate race there, the Lieutenant Governor Mandela Barnes for it, saying that he supports ending the filibuster and expanding voter rights. Val Demings in the state of Florida says it's now time to get rid of the Senate filibuster. And what you find is that of these competitive Republican races, all five of the Democratic Party frontrunners support ending the filibuster. And if we're being honest about races that will truly become competitive by the end of the selection cycle, you have maybe Wisconsin and Pennsylvania, Ohio, North Carolina, and Florida probably could be grouped into the Republican side, but American politics can change very rapidly. Things can end up being closer than expected and could end up going to a party that nobody predicted was going to win. And seeing this with five seats here, all the Democratic Party would have to do, and saying it is a lot easier than actually doing it, but all the Democratic Party would have to do is win two of these seats. If the Republicans won Ohio, won North Carolina, won Florida, if Democrats win Wisconsin and Pennsylvania, which doesn't actually seem too difficult considering they did it in 2020 and 2018, that would give them, at least based off of promises before the election, enough to negate the need for Joe Manchin and Kirsten Sinema, meaning that even if the rule change is 50-50, there you have Vice President Harris bringing you to 51 and finishing that off and saying that, yes, we will change the legislative filibuster. Now, remind yourself that you need control of the House on the Democratic side in order for Democrats to go forward with this. I do not think that they would decide to move forward with ending the filibuster if they did not have control of the House, because then there would be no need. The majority party there the Democrats in that position would not be able to pass anything, and then it would just become a problem of the House. And then the next time Democrats win the House, maybe they could consider it right then. Which is why the Democratic Party has such an urgency about changing the filibuster right now and today, and why they are pressuring Joe Manchin and Kirsten Sinema, why Joe Biden is finally coming out urging a change to the filibuster. For the first time in his entire life, in his entire political career, Joe Biden says that he ch supports changing the legislative filibuster. I mean, this is definitely monumental news, but at the end of the day, 
it isn't swaying the votes of Kirsten Sinema and Joe Manchin. But Democrats might have to do that just without them after 2022. Now, it definitely is uh, a very big uh, situation for the midterm elections. You know, I think that it definitely is going to be difficult for Democrats in order to win control of the House and the Senate after such an abysmal two years. Uh, I think you know, seeing how the uh, how we expect the Senate and the House to proceed onward is just simply being unable to pass anything major for President Biden. Budget reconciliation isn't going to go much further beyond maybe another COVID-19 stimulus check with the resurgence of COVID across the country. Maybe then that could be some type of big win for the Democratic Party. But beyond that, they aren't going to get past these filibuster rules and they can't do anything until after the 2022 Senate elections unless we see changes from Kirsten Sinema and Joe Manchin. And chances are we simply will not. So you can see that there are five ways or at least uh, a combination within these five Senate seats that the Democratic Party could find senators that if they are to win their elections in 2022 could support changing the filibuster. But beyond these five, there aren't really any more competitive seats for the Democratic Party, and they are limited to these five. They aren't the most winnable seats, especially given the national environment, but it is something that Democrats need to explore because the current delegation just simply doesn't cut it. This is the only Senate map they will be provided with in 2022, which means their only options are Wisconsin, Pennsylvania, Pennsylvania, Ohio, North Carolina, and Florida, three of which were won by Donald Trump in both 2016 and 2020, which makes it difficult, on top of playing defense in Nevada, Arizona, Georgia, and New Hampshire. And only time will tell how those races will end up turning up. So thank you guys so much for watching this video. Make sure to comment down suggestions below. Subscribe on the left if you haven't already and check out the Instagram and Twitter. At the bottom left of the screen, there's also a Discord server for you to go ahead and join. On the screen, there's a video you can watch and then a playlist for my 2022 Senate election analysis videos. Again, thank you guys so much for watching and I will see you all tomorrow.